Hey all, today we're going to talk about the integral test, section 11.3, but most important in there is p-series, so I'm going to start by telling what a p-series is. So a p-series is an infinite series that looks like this. So you pick a number p, and then you add up all the numbers 1 over k to the p. So when p equals 1, you get this series, 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth, and so on. And when p equals 2, you get this series, 1 plus a half squared plus a third squared plus a fourth squared, and so on. I want to call out p equals 1 is called the harmonic series. That'll be an example we talk about a lot, so um, uh, worth knowing its name. Um, okay, so we now have two special series. These are kind of our um, fiduciary series, our series that we compare to, um, uh, that we have names, the geometric series, which looks like um, a number raised to the k, so the index appears in the exponent, and then we have the p-series, which looks like k raised to a number either k raised to a negative power or 1 over k raised to a positive power. So k is in the base. Um, really helpful just to be able to recognize them. This isn't a big deal. I mean, it isn't hard, but it is important. So too fast, sorry. Here's some examples where I just want you to identify. Is it a p-series? In which case, tell me p. Is it a geometric series? In which case, tell me a and r. Or is it neither? So in the first case, 1 over square root of n is the same as 1 over n to the 1 half. That is the index raised to a power. So that is a p-series with p equals 1 half. In the second case, I don't give you a formula for it. I just give you the terms of the series. And we could write a formula for it, but notice each term is negative 1 times the last. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Negative 1 times negative 3 is positive 3. So if each term is a constant multiple of the last, then it's a geometric series. A is the initial term. R is how much you multiply by. So it's a geometric series with A equals 3 and R equals minus 1. The third term, which we can write as sigma 1 over k factorial, uh, it's got a factorial in it. It's not an exponent. So it's neither a p-series nor a geometric series. So series that are kind of a complicated formula are neither. Here are some examples. Um, oh. OK, more examples for you to work on. Um, so we need to know when a p-series uh, converges and when it diverges. And that, of course, depends on p. Um, uh, but to get there, we want to develop the integral test. So I want you to notice that when you have an expression like inside a series, the term is a function of n or of k. If we just stick an x in there instead, so 1 over k squared becomes 1 over x squared, n over 2 to the n becomes x over 2 to the x, ln of k becomes ln of x. Now you can think of it as a function of any real number. Few cases, like k factorial, we don't know how to take x factorial. Um, so a few cases you can't do this, but most formulas, you can just write it as a regular real function. Um, once you write it as a real function, you can graph it. So 1 over k squared, its graph looks like 1 over x squared. 1 over n, its graph looks like 1 over x. Um, and then when, once you look at the graph, if, so here k is going from 1 to infinity, so if for x between 1 and infinity the function is positive, that is above the x-axis, and decreasing, going down as x gets bigger, then in that case we can use the integral test. Okay, so all of that was the setup. You turn the terms into a function of x. You check that it is positive and decreasing. We'll talk more about that, at least when x is bigger than 1. And in that case, you can 
to decide if it converges, you can replace the sum with the integral. So the integral test says that under those circumstances, if the integral of the function converges, then the series converges. If it diverges, the series diverges. Not to the same thing, but they both do the same behavior. So here, we replace 1 over k squared, the sum from 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared, with the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared. Remember, that's the same as x to the minus 2. So when we integrate it, we get add 1 to the exponent, divide by minus 1. So we get minus x to the minus 1 from 1 to infinity. And that's equal to minus 1 over 1, minus minus, I'm sorry, minus 1 over infinity, minus minus 1 over 1. 1 over infinity is 0. That's 1. So the first case converges. first use of the eraser in a video. I'm very excited. Um, in the second case, 1 over n, we replace it with the integral. Whoa, that's not what I meant to do. The integral from 1 to infinity, 1 over x dx. That's log of x. So that becomes ln infinity minus ln of 1. ln of infinity is infinity. So this diverges. OK? So that's how you do the integral test. You replace the integral by, you replace, sorry, the sum by an integral. k turns into x. The sigma turns into an integral. You add a dx, you do that integral. It's now an improper integral, so we have to remember our improper integral uh, skills. And then if that converges, the integral converges. If that diverges, the integral diverges. I want to just show you very quickly why that's true. If you replace a 1 over n with 1 over x, The integral of 1 over x is the area, um, and the sum, if now if you chop this up, if you make a Riemann sum of width 1, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, then um, what you find is the area of each Riemann rectangle is one term of the sum. So this is really cool. The infinite sum is a left Riemann approximation to the integral, but also um, it is one term more than a right Riemann um, representation because the right Riemann sums are also terms, but they're one off. Um, so you find that the integral is between two different versions of the sum. And from that, it becomes, it's easy to see, so I'm not making the argument, but I'm giving you the feel. By relating the Riemann sums to the integral, it's easy to see that if one converges, the other converges. OK. Uh, here's a good point to make, good time to make a general point about infinite series. If I write out an infinite series, like 1 over k squared, it's an infinite sum of terms. So we now know this converges. I'm going to tell you a wonderful fact, which is what it converges to is not something you would have guessed. It converges to pi squared over 6. It takes a lot of mathematics to get to the point of seeing that. Um, but uh, who would have guessed? So, in any case, that converges to something. If I change the first few terms, if, say, I change 1 to 4, 1 fourth to 2 fourths, 1 ninth to minus 11, and from then on keep all the terms the same, I'm going to change what this converges to, but not whether it converges, right? Because I'm just going to, what it converges to is going to be the, the original thing 
minus all the terms I threw away plus all the terms I added, which is a finite number, whatever it is. So here's the principle. Nothing you do to the first few terms, by few I mean, could mean a thousand, affects whether the series converges. It affects what it converges to, but not whether it converges. If you delete the first 50 terms, if you add 20 new terms, if you rearrange them, if you change their values, it doesn't matter. So in all the tests we have of whether or not something converges, there's going to be fine print things like, oh, well, the function is decreasing in positive, or often it'll be the terms are positive, or something like that. In all those cases, as long as that's eventually true, even if it's not true the first few terms, you can still use the test. So here's an example. Here's an infinite series, k e to the minus k. Generally, if you see things like e to the x and ln of x, which we pretty much only see in calculus -y situations, uh, you're, that's going to suggest to you, you might think about using the integral test because the function x e to the minus x is the kind of thing we integrate. Um, so if you think about doing the integral test, you would say, oh, let's look at the function x e to the minus x. I'm going to graph it down here. If you graph it on your graphing calculator, you see that it's positive, but it's not always decreasing. Doesn't matter. Past this point, it's always decreasing, so we can still use the integral test. Okay? So as long as the function is not constantly going up and down, you're generally going to be just fine. When we do that, integrating x e to the minus x dx, you will recognize that's an integration by parts. I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. Uh, you get this is the antiderivative. There's a little typo. When you plug in infinity, you get a problem. Look at this. That's infinity over infinity, which is indeterminate. What do we do? This is a time when you remember that that infinity is shorthand for a limit, right? So the correct statement about this in proper integral, it is the limit as b goes to infinity of this quantity, minus b over e to the b plus 1 over b, and then this just turns into 1. These guys turn into 1. What does b over e to the b do? That's easy. As b goes to infinity, e to the b grows faster, so this whole thing goes to 0. Okay, whatever superhero thing you want to say that. This converges, so the integral and the sum converges. Okay, one last thing to say. I am hitting my, really trying to get within 15 minutes here. Um, the key point, the integral test will not come up very often, but it's, we really, really need it for one thing, which is p-series. Um, if you do the integral of a, if you replace the p-series by the integral, 1 over x to the p, which is the same as x to the minus p, that integrates to add 1 to the exponent, divide by the exponent, x to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p. When you plug in infinity, it looks like this. If p is bigger than 1, 1 minus p is negative, this is a negative exponent. Infinity to a negative exponent goes to zero, so this converges. So when p is greater than 1, the p-series converges. If p is less than 1, this integral is infinity to a positive power, because 1 minus p is positive. Infinity to a positive power is infinity, and it diverges. Okay. And then finally, if p is equal to 1, remember you can't integrate using the power rule. That is the special case where you use the natural log, and you get infinity. So the integral test tells us that p series converge if p is greater than 1 and diverge if p is less than or equal to 1. This looks a lot like the geometric series, but kind of the inequalities are switched around in a confusing way really important that when you're using when once you've compared something as we will do to a geometric or a p-series you just 
make sure you've got the test right. Okay, I have hit 15 minutes, so I'm going to say my one last thing very quickly. There's a little extra bit that the integral test gives you. We will not spend time on it, but I would love you to see it, which is it is it actually tells you how close, remember the partial sums, once you know the series converges, the partial sums converge to that series, they're getting closer and closer, the integral test tells you how close. So the integral test tells you the error, that is the difference between the actual limit, the infinite sum, and the approximation, the finite sum. It tells you the limit is given by a certain integral. It's between the integral from n to infinity and the integral from n plus 1 to infinity. So here's an example that I will let you work through to see that this series we were talking about, 1 over k squared, if you take it out to 100 terms, you get this number. And if you integrate 1 over x squared, which we already did, you find that, that the error is approximately 1 over 100. So um, this number is within 1 one hundredth of the actual infinite limit. Okay, stopping there, have a great day.